An essential aspect of a solid REST API is making sure that these resources are protected in such a way that only properly authorized users and clients can get access to them. This has traditionally been quite challenging in the ASP.NET Core world, but thanks to the latest innovations in the platform, protecting your web API could not be easier. So today I'm going to show you how to protect your ASP.NET Core web API in just a few steps. Let's start. There are many ways to authenticate users so that they can access your REST API. However, the ideal and modern approach is called token-based authentication, and it works like this. When a user wants to get access to the REST API resources via his client, let's say a browser, the client first requests authorization from what is known as an authorization server, which usually lives somewhere in the cloud. The authorization server presents a login form where the user enters his or her username and password. Once the user submits the form, the authorization server verifies the credentials and then it generates an encoded access token and sends it back to the client. This token includes information about how to verify it is a valid token, where it came from, where it can be used, who is authorized by the token, meaning the person that successfully logged in, what can be done with the token, and much more. The client can then use this token to try to access your REST API. If the API can verify that this token is valid and presents the required authorization, it will allow it, perform the requested operation, and return a successful response. Now, how do you protect an ASP.NET Core Web API so that it only allows requests that include valid tokens? And how do you read information included in these encoded tokens? Also, is there any way we can generate the tokens for local development without having to involve an entire authorization server? Well, let's jump into the code and let's learn how to do all of this. To demonstrate how to protect an ASP.NET Core Web API, I'm going to create a very simple fictional API that will provide access to a series of games purchased by video game players. Now, what I'm going to show you here uses very recent features that became available with .NET 7. So to follow along, you're going to need at least a .NET 7 SDK in your box. And in fact, I can show you quickly the version that I'm using here. So I'll just do .NET version. And yeah, as you can see, the version I'm using today is version 7.0.1.0.2. All right, let me clean this. And so let's start by creating our Web API project. So I'm just going to say .NET new web, and the name that we're going to be using is Games API. All right, so it's going to create our project. And what I'm going to do now is just uh, switch my VS Code instance into that new directory. So I'll just do code, and then I'll go into Games API, and then I'll do dash R so that I can reuse this same code instance. Hit enter. And here we are now in the context of our Games API project. So you're going to get this prompt uh, to add a few missing files and so say yes. That's going to help us to be able to build and debug our project in VS Code. And um, if you go into Perron CS, you're going to see that this is a super, super simple uh, API at this point. In fact, the only thing that it does is just show hello world. And I can show you how that works. I'll do Control J to open my terminal. I'll just going to do .NET run. OK, so let's see what we get. Okay, so the app is running, import uh, 5026. I'm going to copy that location. I'm going to open my browser over here, and I'm going to paste that. And as you can see, all you get is just a very simple hello world over there. Okay, uh, but I'm going to close this, and that's not really what we want to do here. Uh, what we're going to do is just, like I said, uh, introduce a couple of operations into the REST REST API so that users can access a, a list of purchased games. So the first thing we're going to do is to introduce, and let me collapse this for a moment, is to introduce an in-memory map of uh, the list of games that each of our users has purchased. Okay, so for this we're going to be creating just a very simple dictionary. So I'm going to type here dictionary of string and list of string. Let's name it games map. And so yeah, this is going to be new. And so let's define the contents of, of this dictionary right here. So each element is going to have the key is going to be the name of the player. So let's say this is player one. And then the value is going to be a new list of type string. And let's define a few elements for this list. So here we just have to figure out like a few names of games. So let's say, let, I'll just go for with some of my favorites. So let's say Street Fighter, Street Fighter 2. Minecraft, 
all right and so yeah let's say that's for player one and i'm going to actually close this right here and so let's say we have a second player it's going to be player two and so this guy is going to have a couple of other games forza horizon 5 we also have final fantasy 14 i'm using a comma here so let me add that comma and lastly this is going to be fifa 23 all right so there you go so with this map it is kind of a fictional representation of the fact that player one has purchased these two games and player two has purchased these three games so now what i want to do is to just set up an endpoint that can retrieve all of the uh, games purchased by all users so i'm going to take advantage of this uh, endpoint that has already been defined here which by the way this uses what, what is called the minimal api framework It's a, a innovation of uh, that showed up with the net six i think and so it's a very nice and simple way to declare your apis so what i'm going to say here is that whenever uh, somebody goes into the player uh, games endpoint here we're going to be returning not hello world but instead we're going to be returning our games map so it's just that simple so let's try it out i'm going to do a control j and I'm going to do .NET run once again, okay? And so, yeah, I mean, at this point, we could go back into the browser, but it would be better to actually use something more uh, more interesting that lets us keep working within VS Code without having to switch apps. So for that, what I'm going to be using is a one extension uh, that let me show you here in extensions. If you go to the extensions view, look for this one called REST client here so i have it installed already if you have if you don't have it just go ahead and install it it's a very nice extension that allows you to do a bunch of uh, very cool stuff uh, within vs code with your rest apis okay so let me close that and what i'm going to do uh, in fact is to create a brand new file at the root of, of my directory here so i'm going to say new file and this file is going to be named games.http okay and so this is the file that I, where we're going to be uh, declaring all of the requests that we're going to be making into the API. And so to declare a request, all you have to do is just uh, put the verb, in this case, get, and then what's going to be the location uh, that, that you want to invoke. In our case, we know that that's going to be HTTP localhost 5026, just like that. But we also define that our API uh, is in the player games endpoint. So I'm going to copy that over here, player games. And uh, just like that, we can go ahead and click send, send request. Let me collapse this. As you can see on the right side, we have the results of our request. It was, this was a successful request and we have our games map uh, down here. Okay, so that is great. I think that serves very well uh, for us to start uh, introducing uh, the required uh, authorization elements to the application. Because of course, we don't want uh, really everybody to just come in here and use our API to get the list of all the games purchased by all of our players, right? And so we want to somehow protect this API here. So how to do that? So let me close this and let me close that. And probably I'm going to just uh, also stop, yeah, stop my server there. So I'll close this. So how do we introduce a authorization into this API? It's actually very, very straightforward. The first thing you want to do is actually to set up uh, your endpoint so that it requires authorization, right? So that people cannot just go ahead and, and access that endpoint freely. So to do that, all you have to do is just, and I'm going to put this in, in another line here, is just say dot require authorization. So by doing this, uh, people is going to be required to present uh, the corresponding access token uh, to be able to access the, the API. However, before you can use this, you also have to uh, enable the required uh, authorization services in your application. So for that, you can take advantage of this builder object. So you can say builder, and then this, uh, as you may know, this includes all the series of services that have been registered for the application, right? And so if you go into services, and then you go into add authorization, all right? That's going to go ahead and uh, uh, use the, you know, the dependency injection mechanism to register all the services that are required by authorization and that will enable this required authorization uh, method over here. Now, if you try things uh, just like this, uh, let me show you what's going to happen. So I'm going to open my terminal. I'm going to do .NET run once again. Okay, and if we go back into our games.http, here and then click on send request what you're going to get is actually a bit of an error 
So you can see that uh, it's complaining because it's saying that it cannot find the required authorization authentication service uh, for the application, right? And this this makes sense because before uh, we can do the the authorization element. Let me stop my terminal uh, here and close this and close that. Uh, before we can do any sort of authorization, we have to uh, have a way to uh, authenticate and uh, and decode that access token that's going to come in into the application. So for that, we're going to be needing uh, authentic authentication services, right? And for that, we're going to be needing just one more uh, new Nougat package. So let me open my terminal here. I'm going to clean this. The package that I want to install here is .NET a package Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.Authentication Jot better. Right? Now hit enter. Okay. So if we close our terminal now and go into our Games API CS proc, we're going to notice that we have that brand new dependency over here. And by the way, uh, you'll hear me say either JOT or JWT uh, across this uh, across this video. Uh, so there's just two ways to mention the same thing. JWT really means JSON Web Token, uh, but it's commonly pronounced as JOT. So now that we have that, I'm going to go ahead and close this project file. And we are now uh, able to add the required authentication services. So I'm going to do that just on top of this uh, initial authorization call. I'm going to just say builder.services.addAuthentication. And then I'll say add jot better. So this is going to add the services for a, what is known as better authentication, uh, which works in a way that ASP.NET Core is going to extract the access token that is also known as a better token from the incoming request and it's going to validate that it is indeed a, a valid token, right? And later on, that's going to translate into taking all of the decoded information from that token that is later going to be handed over into the uh, authorization middleware so that we can figure out what exactly is coming in in that token. So let's see how this works. So with that in place, I'm going to do Ctrl J and I'm going to uh, go ahead and run my application once again. Okay, so it's running and I'm going to collapse this and then back to game HTTP. I'm going to hit send request. And in fact, notice that our request is now unauthorized, right? Which is expectation. And this is good. This means that nobody can now just access uh, the endpoint without presenting the relevant access token. So that is required now. Right, so that's good. Uh, but then, yeah, comes the question. So how do now I come up with that uh, required access token? And the traditional way in the past would be uh, to, of course, uh, figure out a way to get access to an authorization server so that that server can generate an access token with all the required configurations so that we can use it in our REST API. And you still have to do that for a production uh, setting, right? And it's a, a bit of a challenging task. Uh, but for a local development environment, there's a much easier way that is enabled with the re recent development in the uh, .NET world. So let me show you this. I'm going to close this. And I'm going to open up my terminal here. So I'll do Control J. And I'm going to just uh, Control C to stop my server. And what I'd like to do is actually to do a split uh, terminal with this button here. Split terminal so we can see better. And on the right side, what I'm going to do is use this brand new tool that is called .NET User JWTS. Okay, so this is a tool that you can use in your box to generate tokens without requiring any sort of authorization server. So let me show you how it works. So to create a very basic token, what you can do is just say the .NET User JWTS and then create. So hit enter. And uh, that's going to go ahead and as you can see, it produces a token right away right is, is right here and so uh, as expected this is, is is all encoded right and you may be wondering well what what is really behind uh, that token and that's something that i think is, is good to understand and so to understand what is behind this token there's a, a couple of ways a uh, one way it, that you can do it is by just using the tool itself uh, because as you can see there is a, a an, um, an id right here for the generated token and so using that id but you can just copy that that id and you can say, let me clean this, .NET user JWTS print, and then the ID, hit enter, and that is going to give you all the information about that generated token, right? And so, but the other way, but it's going to be more traditional and what is actually very good to understand is by using a, another, a, 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 another page that can decode this token and give you more information about everything that's going on there. And so let me just copy the token here, I'll copy that, and I'm going to go into this page. 
that is called JWTMS, and there's there's a bunch of pages uh, like this, by the way. This is just one, but what we can do here is just paste a token, and as you can see on the bottom, uh, you get a decoded version of the token right away. Okay, now. Uh, Regarding this token, notice that it is made of three parts, right? So this red part is the what is known as the header. The second part is the payload, and the last part is the signature. Now, what is in each of these parts? And I'm not going to go into a lot of details about about this here, but just so that so that you know a few details about this. Uh, the first part, like I said, is the header, and that defines the algorithm that was used to compute uh, or to encode a token itself, right? And it also includes the type, which is a JSON Web Token, right? And so, but then in the body, which is the more, most interesting part, is the actual set of claims that are included as part of this generated token. So whoever produced this token uh, included all of this information uh, on it. And that includes things like, the, for instance, the sub, which is who was authorized by, by this token, right? In this case, it just is Julio because that's, that's the name of me in this machine and we use it the, 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 the little tool to generate it in my box. But it will include something different if, if it was a production environment. Uh, another important part is going to be the audience, this set here, which includes all of the URLs of the services that are the intended audience for the token. So who is expected to receive this token or who do we, did we generate this token for? Now, where did, this, did this, all of these URLs came from? That actually came from, if you see VS Code, and if we go into Explorer and you go into Launch Settings at JSON, let me collapse this for a moment. You're going to see that here's where the .NET SDK template placed a bunch of URLs associated to the project. And here's you're going to find uh, the, for instance, for, we're using HTTP now, which is the, the default. You're going to find that here's the URL that we're using for HTTP. But if you wanted to, we could also use HTTPS, which is in this other URL over here. And there's also URLs for IES or X Express if you wanted to use that. There's a URL over here and there's another port over here. So all of these URLs are the ones that are considered as valid audiences by the tool. So when the token comes into the application, uh, it must include one of the, the URLs that we are specifying for our application. Then you also have a bunch of uh, dates, for instance, uh, like these two here, which represents the range of dates uh, on which the token is valid, so it will, it will not be valid before this date or after this date. And yeah, we'll not get into details into how this, this date got computed. It's a different way to represent a date. Uh, but yeah, we got those and we also have uh, this one here. It represents when exactly was the token generated. And lastly, we have the issuer here, which represents the entity or the or the server or the session server that actually generated uh, the token, so who generated this token. Now, if you want to get more details about any of these claims, what you can actually do is just go into claims over here, and it's going to show a bunch of details uh, more, uh, just so that you can know more about each of them. But the important part, if you go back into the code token, is that uh, the signature that we have over here in green was computed from the combination of the information in the header and the payload here, right? So this was combined and we use it, the algorithm defined over here, the HS256, and then that was used to compute the signature that's in green here. And so that means that if uh, anything in, in this long string here is modified for any reason, then the signature is not going to match and that turns it into an invalid token, right? So that's kind of a one way to prevent a uh, modifications of the token uh, along the way. And that's why the signature is super important. Now, back into our project over here, one more thing that you should notice is that uh, the tool did not just generate the token. It also configured our service or our web API so that it can use that token. And so if you close this and we go now into app settings that develop that JSON, you're going to notice that we have this brand new section over here, the authentication section. So this defines uh, a couple of important things. The first thing is going to be the valid audiences. Right, which defines all of the uh, of the audiences that our service declares that are valid uh, for the token. So the token has to be generated for one of these four audiences, which again, if you remember, going back to the page, uh, is is the list of audiences that are included in the token already. Right, so those are going to match just fine. And then it also includes a valid issuer, which is, like I mentioned, is who generated this token. In, in this case, it's just our little tool, uh, but the issuer in a more production setting will be the, the, the address of whoever is the authorization server that generates this token, right? So again, this has to match what comes in the token. And in fact, it does match uh, right now, right? The same uh, issuer. Okay, so just keep in mind that both of these things are needed uh, for the, for the uh, authorization to work properly, right? And luckily the tool is doing all of this for us, so we don't have to worry about all those details. Now let's close this and then, well, let's see how do we actually use that token, right? So let's do Ctrl J. 
and then here we're back into our screen here and so we have a token right here so I'm going to go ahead and copy this this full string so I'll copy that and uh, what you want to do here is to uh, add a header to your request right because right now it's just a very simple request it doesn't include it doesn't include any headers but you need to include a new header that is known as the authorization header so you have to say authorization and then you have to specify what kind of the, uh, of authorization you want you want to be using in this case it is known as a better authentication right so that you can we can use the job tokens and then what you want to do is just paste that long string so i'm just going to go ahead and paste it over here it's very long uh, but that is how uh, you can specify a, a new header with authentication uh, in this in games at http using this rest line and if you're using you're using any other tool uh, for calling your rest api there's also always going to be a way to specify this additional header okay so with that in place let me go ahead and restart my server so i'm going to clean this i'm going to say dotnet run so it uses the new configurations in app development at json and then let's try to send a request and see what we get so i click here and as you can see and let me collapse this this time we do have an uh, 200 okay okay the request was validated uh, because we presented a valid token right and we can see the full list of games uh, down here so authorization is working as expected now this this looks great uh, but of course i mean we can start uh, thinking of other uh, possible scenarios that are related kind of to authorization so for instance I think not everybody should be able to get the full list of all of the games that were purchased by all of the players, right? So this is more of an administrative task, right? Somebody will have would, will have some sort of administrative client uh, that wants to get a, a list of all of the of this information, but this should not be available for every single user of the system. So how can we enable something like role-based authentication so that let's say only administrators can see this information here? So let's see how to do that. Let me uh, close this and let me open my terminal i'm going to stop my server right there yeah it stopped to so close this and let's go back to program cs so if you scroll down a little bit let's say down here remember that we use this require authorization method to recall authorization into a rest api what we can do now is to expand this to use or to define a more specific policy that will include a, a new requirement and so what we can do here is just say policy and so this is going to be kind of a lambda function there just like that and so with this policy object we can do something else we can now say policy dot and we can do a bunch of things and among them is going to be require role right so require role is going to be used to require that there has to be a role claim in the set of claims presented by the token and that role claim has to include whatever value we specify here so that value let's say is going to be just admin right and so just by doing this we are saying that uh, yeah in the token there has to be an admin a role claim otherwise it will not uh, be allowed and so just after making that change let's do control uh, control j and let's go back into the terminal let me clean this and let's run this once again and let's see what happens right so i'm going to collapse this and go back to games http uh, let's go ahead and run the request once again and see what happens well as expected this time we are getting a 403 forbidden and that, is, that means that uh, the request was actually authenticated uh, but it does not present the required claims so it cannot be authorized to, to go in right so and this is good and in fact if we go back uh, once again into the terminal or actually into our page uh, over here uh, we'll see that there's there's really no role claim uh, right now right as expected so what we want to do is just to generate a brand new token that includes that role claim so that we can verify that we can that we can actually uh, uh, authorize a user based on, on the role so i'm going to clean this here and we're going to be running the same dotnet uh, user jwts create command but now we're going to append one more thing which is going to be the role and that role is going to be just admin so I'll hit enter and this new token as you can see it does include the admin role as it mentions right there and but yeah just to make sure I'm going to copy copy the token I'm going to go back into our page over here and I'm going to replace that with this this brand new token and here you're going to notice that the role claim is included right there so now this token has been generated for uh, with uh, for an administrator so if we now go back into Visual Studio Code and we use that token over here, so I'm going to delete this and I'll paste the brand new one there. I'm going to send a request. And as you can see, once again, the, the request got uh, authorized. So we got a 200 OK and we got our, uh, our games, right? So that is kind of how you can configure role-based authentication uh, in your uh, web API. 
So now that is great. And then uh, let me actually go back here and let me close, uh, stop my server right there back here. So let's say that now we want to introduce a brand new endpoint and the idea of this endpoint is that uh, we can retrieve all of the list of games purchased by the user that that makes the call of this uh, to, to this REST API, right? So the user is going to invoke an endpoint and it's going to receive back all of the games that belong to himself or to herself. So once again, so let's go down here. We're going to say just app.mapget and then let's give it uh, another name. So this is going to be named, let's say my games. Okay, and then once again, we are going to need to have uh, some Lambda function here to tell to tell uh, the program what to do when, when a request comes in there. Now, how can we figure out who is really calling a REST API, right? And so, of course, we, we could try to figure out, okay, so how am I going to decode uh, this uh, the, the incoming token? Because information is right there, right? So if we go back uh, in here, uh, we can tell that here is Julio, right? Julio is, is the one that authenticated and that got assigned this token. Uh, but do we need to be to, to decode this, this entire gearish here uh, to be able to get that information into our application here? Uh, fortunately, that's not the case. And all we have to do is to receive one object here that is uh, of type, type claims principle, right? And I'll just call it user. And to use this, you're going to have to do, I'm going to do control dot. You need to import system.security.claims like that. Okay, and so what we're doing here is just doing a little bit of dependency injection so that ASP.NET Core injects, I mean, after it decodes the token, it creates this claims principle object and we can request it via dependency injection into our method over here, right? And then we can go ahead and, and take advantage of it, okay? So that, that, that takes us away of, of all that work of decoding the token that's been done for us, so we can just use this. And so with any place where we can say the following, so the username, it's going to be just user dot identity identity dot name, okay? So that represents uh, the name or the sub that's included in the token. Now identity is a, a is a property that might be uh, nullable here, right? So the the compiler here is just warning us, hey, identity might be null, so you may be getting a null value here, so be aware of that. And so we want to make sure that that's that's not going to happen ever. And so for that, what we can say is just check this very quickly. So what I'm going to just say here is argument null exception, trove null, and then I'll say user dot identity dot name. All right. So by doing this, I'm saying that if identity is null or if name is null, either of this is null, you're going to just throw an exception here, right? So because we cannot move forward. And so by doing that, we know that if we reach this line here, uh, identity name must have some sort of a value. So great, so now we have the username. What we want to do is just return the list of games for that user. And since, I mean, luckily we have a very simple dictionary here. So all we have to do is to match one of these keys to the user that has been provided. So technically all we have to do here is just say, okay, so we're going to say return games map sub um, username. And so that will go ahead and retrieve the, the, the value for, for that specific key, and that should be all we need to do. Uh, however, of course, there's still the case that somebody uh, that is not included in the map, right? somebody that is not player one or player two, uh, is going to invoke a REST API. So in that case, I mean, we can, we can take a few options here. And the option I'm going to go for is uh, that if that happens, I'm just going to return an empty end result because that user is, does not have any games. And so to do that, what I'm going to just say is the following. If not games map contains contains key username, we are going to return let's say just results dot empty, okay, and uh, which is just an empty an empty result. Uh, but of course, I mean yeah, the the compiler is complaining here because we're returning one type here and a very different type over here, and that doesn't make sense. You have to return just one one consistent thing. So what we can do now is just say instead of this, we're going to say that this is going to return results dot okay, and then in that okay, we return the actual uh, list of games. Okay, so that makes it consistent because we are always returning an i result in this case, All right? And so. Yeah, so with that, we should be able to go ahead and retrieve the games for the user. And then one more thing that we may want to do here is to also require, I mean, <laughs> require authorization, right? So what I'm going to do is just copy the require authorization section from the previous endpoint, and I'm going to paste that down here, okay? So that our brand new endpoint also requires authorization. Now, 
for this one, we are not actually going to require an administrator, right? So this should be open for all of our players. Uh, so let's switch from admin into player here. Okay, so whoever invokes uh, this, this endpoint has to include the player uh, role in the claims. Okay, so now let's go back into our terminal. Let's see what we have to do. So first, the first thing is going to be that we're actually going to need a brand new token, right? Because the admin token that we created is not going to be useful. So on the right side, I'm going to go ahead and run once again our tool. And then I'm going to say that the role is going to be player. Okay. So let's say, let's see what happens when I, I use that token. So and in order to use it, well, let's first start our server. So let's start the server on the left side. And then let's go into games.http. And so let's add a brand new line. And to separate things here, what you want to do is just add three pounds like that. And then you can go ahead and copy or add your other request. Now, our new request is actually called, uh, the endpoint is called my games. So I'm going to put that over here, my games. Okay. And the authorization better. Now we're going to, we're going to paste our brand new token. So I'll copy that, paste it over here. And we should be ready to invoke our request. So I'm going to hit on send request. And indeed, this was a success. I mean, it did not reject the request, as you can see. But also, we are not getting <laughs> any games. Uh, does that make sense? Well, it actually makes sense because if we look at our token, uh, and I'm going to bring it over here. We look at our token, I'm going to clean this and paste a new token down here. Uh, it indeed includes the player role, but this was generated for Julio, right? Sub is Julio. And it turns to be that Julio is not included in the list of players in our dictionary, right? In games map, there's no Julio, there's only player one and player two. So what we want to do now is to generate a token specifically for one of these, uh, or one of these two, right? Or just change one of these to Julio, <laughs> whatever makes sense. But uh, let's see what, what we can do in the tool to generate a token for a very specific uh, user. So I'm going to do Ctrl J and let's clean this. And so it's going to, the, the, the line is going to be similar to the one before, but what you want to add here is the name of the user. So for that, you, all you have to do is just say dash N and then the name. So in this case, it's going to be, let's say player one, player one, and then I'll hit enter. And now, as you can see, this is a token that has been generated for player one. Okay. And then, yeah, we can confirm that very quickly by copy this, copying this new token. We'll paste that over here because we like this page so much right there. And as you can see, yeah, the sub is now player one. All right. So this token should be valid uh, for what we want to do now. So let's go back into our games HTTP and let's delete this token and paste a brand new one, right? In our second request for my games, I'm going to click on send request. And as you can see, now we got not, not just authorized it, but we actually got the list of games that correspond to player one, which are Street Fighter 2 and Minecraft. And let's confirm that that is, that is true. We go here. So yeah, Street Fighter 2 and Minecraft. Okay. So that is how you can uh, take advantage of the current user to return a different set of results from your REST API. Now let's try one more thing. So let's say that now uh, we're moving into a model where our users can not just purchase games, but they can actually subscribe into our service to get the full list of games, right? It's kind of a, a subscription, like the ones that you're going to see in any of the other uh, major um, consoles, right? And so how to enable such a scenario? So in this case, we don't want to associate the games to a specific user. We want to associate them to a subscription. And somehow we want to associate that subscription to our users. So the first thing we're going to do here, and let me do open here. Let me make sure I just stop my server. So yeah, that's stopped now, uh, is to introduce that brand new map of games, right? So what I'm going to do is just copy this map here, copy this down here. And this is going to be not a games map. Let's call this one subscription map. Okay. So this is going to include, let's say two subscriptions. One of them is going to be our, uh, silver subscription, all right, which is going to include uh, just a couple of games. Uh, again, let's say that this, the silver one is going to be a uh, Street Fighter 2. And let's let's say, yeah, it includes Minecraft. Uh, but then we have our gold subscription is going to include those two. OK, those two, but also every other game. Right. So this includes uh, right now our full catalog of games. OK, the gold subscription. So now that we have that, how do we take advantage uh, of this, right? So what we can do is let's go down into our my games endpoint, 
And what we can do now is to uh, look for a very specific claim in the set of claims that were provided as part of a token. So how to do that? So if we go, let's open up a little bit of space here. And let's do this. Var has claim equals user has claim. And then what we're going to do is just check for a claim. Right? It's going to be a claim where claim type is going to be one that we're going to be calling just subscription. Okay, so this is a brand new claim. It's a custom claim that, it, that only uh, our system knows how to create and how to uh, uh, interpret. And so we're going to say that if has claim, so if the, if the user is coming with a token that includes that claim, we're going to go ahead and say, let's let's figure out what is going, what is your subscription, right? And we can do that by saying user dot find first value. So that will give us a value of the claim that we specified. So as we said, the claim is named subscription. So I'm going to copy that over here. And that should give us the value of the, of the subscription that's included in the claim. And then uh, with that, we can just say return results dot okay. And that's going to be the subscription map with that specific subscription. Now, once again, we're getting kind of a compiler warning here saying, hey, you know what? That subs object that you have here might be null because find first value might not find the subscription. And so what we're going to do in that case is just say, okay, well, if that's the case, let's do this, this new call this operation there. And then we're going to say, yeah, let's just throw a new exception. And we're going to say claim has no value. Right. I mean, there are many ways to handle this, uh, of course. Uh, this is just one way. Uh, but uh, with that, as you can see, we are going uh, getting away from that warning and we can move ahead uh, with our logic because there should always be uh, that, uh, that claim over there. So with that in place, uh, we should have our logic in place so that we will, we will first try to uh, find the subscription. If we, if we find that claim, we return all the games from our subscription map for the required subscription. And otherwise, we revert to the previous logic, right? Where we go ahead and return only the games that the user has purchased. But now that takes us back into, well, how do we produce a token that includes this new claim, right? So that's something that we can actually also test via our little tool. So let me open up my terminal here. And on the right side, I'm going to clean this. And what you want to do is, well, let's go back to the line that we had before. So .NET user, I'm going to perhaps do this, yeah. Uh, create role, uh, the role has to be player, right? Uh, the name is going to be player one, but now we're going to in in also include claim. And then here we're going to include subscription equals, and that's going to have the name of the subscription. So let's say we want to give full access. So this is going to be called, right? So I'll hit enter. And so that is going to include uh, and produce a token that is for player one that includes the uh, that is for the player role and that also includes this custom claim named subscription which has a value of gold and once again we can also just copy this token check it out over here let's see what we get how does that look like here notice there's subscription gold right it's a brand new claim all right and so yeah let's test that out i'm going to start my server once again .NET run collapse this back to against that HTTP, and I'm going to replace this token with the brand new token. And so let's hit send request. And as you can see, now this user, because he belongs to the gold subscription, he gets the full list of games, as opposed to just the games that he had previously purchased. So yeah, that's how you can use claims to be, do what we call claims-based uh, authorization, right? And, and as, as you can imagine, you can extend this mechanism, uh, and I'm going to just stop my server now of that, uh, you can extend this mechanism to do a bunch of different kinds of uh, validations and uh, authorizations based on the, on the many different claims that could be incoming in your access tokens. I hope that was useful. And if you'd like to know how to take it to the next level and protect your web API in a production environment, please check out my site for complete courses where I cover that and many other topics that are essential for professional .NET backend development. Consider liking this video if you found it useful and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you are the first to know whenever I publish new videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.